When we last left off our story, the Phoenix Suns and Milwaukee Bucks had just become the latest expansion teams to enter the NBA, and Phoenix was getting ready to embark on its first ever season as an NBA franchise. At first, nobody knew quite what to expect from the new team. But as Arizona's first real foray into the major leagues, they had a lot of work to do to prove once and for all that Phoenix was a big league city. And the future of Arizona as a sports market was fully dependent on the success or failure of the team. And in that regard, the early Suns would face plenty of both in a first decade that saw them hit both surprising highs and depressing lows. Welcome to the early years of Phoenix Suns basketball. Welcome to the Valley. Valley, 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 Valley. At the beginning of the 1968 season, it seemed like there was reason for optimism in Phoenix, as the Suns would go on to win four of their first seven games as an NBA franchise. But unfortunately for them, this was when the wheels of their season would completely fall off. Of the next 75 games that they played, the Suns would go on to win just 12 of them, finishing their first year with a record of 16 wins and 66 losses. Not exactly a great start. Of course, this performance wasn't necessarily a surprise. After all, this was their first season as an expansion franchise, and it was expected that they'd be taking their lumps through the first couple of years. But what this season really showed was that the Suns needed to get much, much better if they were to compete, and they needed to do it quickly. In the NBA, the quickest way of doing this was through the first year player draft. After all, if you were able to get the right generational talent at the right time, you could turn a mediocre team into a title contender basically overnight. And as such, Suns fans had very high hopes of who they would be able to get in that year's draft. But unfortunately for them, and for the Suns, the themes that would come to define this team over the next few decades were disappointments, close calls, and a never-ending stream of what-if moments and the 1969 NBA Draft would be their first true taste of this. As a result of their poor performance during the 1968 season, the Suns had by far the worst record that year. And with the draft lottery not in place, you would expect that this would give them a lock on the first overall pick. However, you would be wrong. At that time, the NBA didn't use record to determine who got the first overall pick. Instead, they did what any rational sports league would do, and they gave away their first overall pick through a coin flip, specifically between the worst team in the West, which was the Suns, and the worst team in the East, which in this case was the 25 and 57 bucks. So instead of sitting comfortably on draft night with the first overall pick on lock, Suns general manager Jerry Colangelo sat anxiously by the phone, calling heads in what would ultimately become the most important coin flip of his entire life. As you may recall from earlier, the Suns actually won an important coin flip just the previous year, the one that gave them the first overall pick in the expansion draft against the Bucks. But unfortunately, one year later, their luck would run out. The coin would end up landing on tails, and despite having nine more wins than the Suns in the previous year, the Milwaukee Bucks would receive the first overall pick in the 1969 draft. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, that doesn't seem so bad. After all, the Suns still have the second overall pick, and any other year, I'd say that's a pretty good point. But in this case, there's just a small problem with that. The problem was that the first overall pick in the 1969 draft was a little known player out of UCLA, a man by the name of Lou Alcindor, or at least, a man who went by the name of Lou Alcindor. The very next season, he would blossom into a bona fide superstar in the NBA, and the Bucks would rocket to second place in the Eastern Conference. And the year after that, with Oscar Robertson now in the mix, he would lead the Bucks to their first NBA title in just their third year of existence. 
and shortly after finishing his sweep of regular season and finals MVP, he made a statement to the media, saying that going forward, he wished to be referred to by his Muslim name, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And the Suns not being able to draft him became the first of many what-if moments that would haunt the franchise over the next 50 years. But even with all that being said, the Suns still have the second overall pick in the draft. So if they weren't able to get Kareem, well, who did they get? Alright, let's get this out of the way right off the bat. No, Neil Walk was no Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. However, as a second overall draft pick, he was everything the Suns could have hoped for and more. A big, imposing center who could shoot and rebound with the best of them. And overall, he put together a pretty darn good career for himself. All told, he played a total of 8 seasons in the NBA, plus another 4 seasons abroad. And in his almost 600 games at the NBA level, he averaged 12.5 points a game and a little under 8 rebounds. Not bad at all. But when he was at his peak in Phoenix, he was legitimately one of the better centers in the NBA. Up until 1993, he was the only Phoenix Sun to average over 20 points and 12 rebounds a game over a single season. And during his breakout in 1972, he actually got revenge on the team that passed him over, scoring a career-high 42 points against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the defending champion Bucks. In fact, he got so much media attention for this performance that he actually missed the team bus after the game because he was doing so many interviews. But all the while, he never let the constant comparisons to Kareem get him down. After all, what person wouldn't want to have the honor of being the second overall draft pick in any draft? And besides, his greatest legacy would actually come well after his playing days were over. In 1988, Walk was diagnosed with a benign tumor that had attached to his spine. And while he was able to get the tumor removed, the procedure to remove it would leave him confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. But while his new reality hit him hard at first, he was able to tackle this new challenge head on, largely thanks to the game that he loved so dearly. Shortly before the procedure, Walk had moved back to Phoenix on a full-time basis, and as he recovered from his surgery, he picked up wheelchair basketball, and eventually he became one of the better players in the country. Throughout all of this, he found a new calling, doing motivational speaking, and also getting another job with the Phoenix Suns organization, this time not as a player, but as a leader in community outreach. Through all of these roles, he would become an inspiration and an advocate for disabled athletes everywhere. And in 1990, he'd be recognized by President George H.W. Bush as the Wheelchair Athlete of the Year. In the decades that followed, Walk would deal with multiple different health problems that would nag at him for the rest of his life. But through all of it, he never let it get in the way of his work. And in fact, he would keep his role with the Suns organization pretty much until his final days on Earth, continuing to make an impact on the Phoenix community until the very end. Neil Walk would pass away in October of 2015. He was 67 years old. Back in 1969, it seemed like the Suns weren't making much progress in their second season. Sure, they had won a few more games and they were on a little bit of a better pace, but it still seemed like the team was mired in mediocrity. And even worse, it seemed like Coach Red Kerr was starting to lose the locker room. Heading toward the midway point of that season, the Suns were sitting at 8 games under 500, and in reality, they were going nowhere fast. This posed a problem to the front office, as both Colangelo and the rest of team leadership knew that if the team was going to thrive in Phoenix, they needed to start showing some signs of life. And so, Colangelo decided it was time to start shaking things up, and to do this, he started taking things into his own hands, quite literally. In one fell swoop, he fired Coach Kerr and installed himself as the head coach of the team. Was this a desperate move? Yes. Was this a selfish move? Absolutely. Did this have a high chance of backfiring and blowing up in his face and costing him his job? Most likely. But for whatever reason, it worked. In the second half of that season, the Suns played with a completely brand new energy. 
and by the end of that year, they had found themselves with 39 wins on the season. Not exactly great, but in a notoriously weak Western Conference that year, it was good enough for them to sneak into the playoffs as the fourth and final seed. All of a sudden, it seemed like the gamble to put the team in Phoenix was starting to pay off. As the team found itself closer and closer to a playoff spot, more and more fans descended to McDowell Road to cheer on the new team. And once they made their way into the Coliseum, they started creating one of the most insane environments in the NBA at the time. In fact, partly thanks to that home field advantage, the Suns would take the heavily favored Lakers to a Game 7 in their first round matchup. And in fact, the environment got so rowdy at the Coliseum that the opposing team's announcer had to mention it on the broadcast. And in the process, he unwittingly gave the Coliseum a nickname that would stick with it for the rest of its lifetime. The Madhouse on McDowell. But even though the Suns would go on to lose Game 7 and get knocked out of the playoffs that year, that small taste of success was enough to get Phoenix invested in Suns basketball. And it really couldn't have come at a better time. Because right as this was happening, the Suns were finally coming into their own as a legitimately good basketball team. With new coach Con Fitzsimmons taking the reins, Dick Van Arsdale leading the way on the court, and Waugh coming into his own as the starting center, the Suns were becoming a legitimate force to be reckoned with. And over their next two seasons, they would win a total of 97 games. But unfortunately for them, during that same time period, the Western Conference went from being notoriously weak to notoriously strong. And despite the fact that they almost won 50 games in both of those seasons, the Suns weren't able to capitalize on that performance by getting another playoff berth. And sadly, things wouldn't get much better for the team over the next three seasons, as they would start to slide slowly back into mediocrity. After the 1972 season, Fitzsimmons left for Atlanta, leaving a coaching vacancy in his wake. But unfortunately for the team, his replacement would only last a total of seven games before being replaced, once again, by Jerry Colangelo. Once again, Colangelo coached them to a decent record, this time getting 38 wins. But this time, he couldn't get as lucky, and the Suns missed the playoffs once again. By the beginning of the next season, the Suns had another brand new head coach in place, and this time they felt like they really had their head coach of the future. But unfortunately, at the time, they just didn't have the talent to put around him. Sure, they still had Van Arsdale, but people like Walk weren't playing up to their potential, and the other key role players on the team had mostly left. So really, they just weren't able to compete with the rest of the players in the Western Conference. And as a result, they would end those seasons with 30 and 32 wins respectively. But heading into the 1975-76 season, it seemed like things were about to change dramatically for Phoenix. And a lot of this had to do with the drastic changes that Colangelo made to the roster. First, there was the new head coach that we alluded to earlier, John McLeod. Before getting recruited to come down to Phoenix, he had built quite a reputation for himself as the head coach of Oklahoma. And while his first two seasons in Phoenix weren't exactly stellar in terms of record, he had quickly gained the trust of both his players and the front office. And as such, he had more than earned the right to stick around for the 75-76 season. In the draft that offseason, the Suns would use the fourth overall pick to draft another prominent Sooner in Alvin Adams. And immediately, he would justify their decision to draft him by averaging 19-9 in his first season, getting named to the All-Star team, and eventually winning Rookie of the Year. Lining up alongside him would be the ever-present Dick Van Arsdale, and another new addition for the 1975 season, Paul Westfall. And together, they would make a great core for the team to build around. But they still needed to add some quality depth pieces to fill out the roster and make the team more complete. And luckily, they had a few of these kinds of players to go around. You see, in the previous season, Neil Walk was traded to the New Orleans Jazz for a package of four players. And of that return, Curtis Perry would become one of the starters on the 1975 team, Dennis Autry and Nate Hawthorne would become role players on the bench, and the fourth player would get traded again in a subsequent move for Ricky Sobers, who would become something of a sixth man for the team. During that season, this Suns roster would improve upon the previous year by a full 10 games, ultimately finishing at 42-40 for the season. Now, 
Is this a phenomenal record? No, not by any means. But it did represent a huge step forward from their previous three seasons. And most importantly, it got them into the playoffs with a third seed in the Western Conference. And ultimately, that playoff appearance would change everything. Their first opponent in the playoffs that year were the Seattle Supersonics, who had finished just one game above them in the standings that season. As you might imagine from their records, this was a very evenly matched series, one where both teams took full advantage of their home courts. But ultimately, Phoenix just proved to be too much to handle, especially when they were playing at the Madhouse. And after a decisive 11 point victory in game six, Phoenix would go on to advance with a 4-2 series victory. But standing in their way in front of them would be an almost impossible task in the form of the number one seed San Francisco Warriors. For all intents and purposes, the Suns had no business being in the same arena as the Warriors. After all, not only were the Warriors the defending champions and had the best record in the NBA by five full games, but the Suns trailed them in the standings by 17 games. It really wasn't a fair fight, at least on paper. And before the series began, no one in the media gave Phoenix even a remote chance to win this series. And frankly, who would blame them? But over the next seven games, Phoenix would prove that they were way more than just their record. In what became one of the greatest series of all time, the Suns would steal game two on the road, win game four in double overtime, and get a game winning last second block in game six to secure a one point victory and take Goliath to game seven. And in a testy final game in San Francisco that featured a full on melee on the court, the Suns did the impossible. They eliminated the Mighty Warriors en route to their very first NBA Finals appearance. Back in Arizona, this sent Suns fans into an absolute frenzy, with celebrations popping up all over the state and an endless sea of adoring fans following the team everywhere they win in the city of Phoenix. At this point, the fandom was much more than just a fandom. It was a movement and it was a movement that fully believed that their team was going to come away with an NBA championship. But standing in the way of making that happen was the other one seed, the Boston Celtics. In many ways, it seemed like the story of the 1976 finals was the story of two polar opposites coming together, with the Celtics being one of the most well-established and well-decorated teams in NBA history, and the Phoenix Suns being the upstart expansion franchise barely on their second playoff appearance. Once again, the less experienced Suns were listed as heavy underdogs, and heading into this series, it looked like it was going to be complete Boston domination, especially as the Celtics would win games one and two at the Garden by a combined 27 points. But once the series shifted back to Phoenix and back into the Madhouse, everything completely changed. The Suns would win Game 3 by a 7 point margin, and in Game 4, they would eke out a 2 point win in front of their home fans. And now, all of a sudden, the two teams were heading into a pivotal Game 5 at the Garden, all tied up. At first, it looked like this was going to be yet another easy victory for the Celtics, as they quickly got out to an 18 point first quarter lead. But slowly and steadily, the Suns would chip away at that deficit until at the very end, they finally tied up the game. When regulation wasn't enough, they went to overtime. And when one overtime wasn't enough, they went to a second overtime. And at the end of that second overtime, it looked like the Celtics were finally going to put away the game for good, as they took a two point lead with just one second left on the clock. However, it was the Suns that had possession of the ball, and as they inbounded at the very last second of the game, they had literally one shot to keep the game alive. At this point, we've talked a little bit about a lot of the players currently on the court, people like Westfall and Van Arsdale, but there is one person that we haven't talked about, and the main reason for that is because, well, he wasn't on the team to begin that season. By 1976, Garfield Hurd had played six seasons at the NBA level, and he was already on his fourth NBA team. He started off in Seattle, was traded to Chicago, got shipped off to Buffalo the very next season, and a couple years later, 
He ended up in Phoenix as part of a trade deadline deal. At that point in his career, he had established himself as a decent starter at power forward, one who could get you about 30 minutes of playing time every single night and usually average about double digits in rebounds. However, he was never much of a scorer. In fact, he would average a little under 9 points a game for his entire career, and he only eclipsed the 15 point per game mark just once. And it's not that he was a terrible shooter or anything like that, it was just not a part of his game to take the extra shot. On that night in Boston, he would play more than any other person on both teams, totaling up 61 minutes of playing time. And yet, here he was, back out there for what could possibly be the final play of the game. In other words, Garfield Hurd was a journeyman power forward still searching for his true home in the NBA. He's still fairly new to the team, and in this lineup, he's currently one of the weaker shooters on the floor. And on top of all of that, he is dog-tired from a long day of basketball. In reality, there is no reason why he should be taking this shot. But in hindsight, it makes it even more special, and even more right, that he did. Won't start until it's touched, they'll have to throw it up. Garhurt, turn around, shot in the air! It's good! It's tied again! I, believe I don't it. believe it! Garfield hurt at the buzzer, threw one in outside. We've got a third overtime in a Boston Garden! Despite their many late game heroics and what would ultimately be called the greatest game ever played, the Suns would end up falling to the Celtics by two points in triple overtime. And a couple of days later, the Celtics would finish the job in game six, clinching yet another NBA title. But while the Suns didn't end up bringing a championship back to Phoenix, they actually succeeded where it counted. They legitimized Phoenix as a national sports city and if the fans weren't galvanized before, they were now fully on board. And ultimately, this newfound fan support and media attention would come to serve Arizona sports quite well going forward, as the Suns looked to enter a new decade strong, and new teams looked for ways to potentially break into the market. 